For those of you who are out there, uh, welcome. My name is Jeff Murray. I am the director of the Calvert Marine Museum. I'd like to welcome you to lecture number three in the Maryland in the Age of Sail series, a series that is continuing. Uh, this is, uh, again, the third lecture. We'll continue every other Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, until we finish it out in about a month with lecture number seven. Uh, tonight's lecture is about the Revolutionary War period, and I think you're going to get a bonus uh, a bonus uh, period that will depend on, you'll get to participate in, in, in choosing in terms of whether it's the interwar period or also the War of 1812. Sorry, I'm letting people in as I speak, so uh, sort of the nature of the game. Uh, but just so you know, we are recording this for posterity so that we can have folks view it uh, off the museum's website at later dates. So uh, please be aware. And uh, if you have a question during, oh, I'll let Mark handle this in terms of how he wants to, uh, to receive questions. There will be time for questions at the end, obviously. Uh, I think if you really need to, to barge in with a question, uh, Mark may let you do that, but I'll, I'll leave the ground rules up to him. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mark Wilkins who is our Curator of Maritime History here at the Calvert Marine Museum, and he can take it away. Thank you, Jeff, <clears throat> and welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, tuning in tonight. Beautiful day today, so uh, uh, thank you for in advance for sacrificing the beautiful weather to be uh, online with us. Also, um, have to uh, mention uh, if there's any uh, fans of the uh, RMS Titanic, we're doing a talk, I'm doing a talk on the Titanic on, not surprisingly, April 14th, uh, so that's in about, what, uh, seven or eight days, something like that, um, so tune in for that if you like, uh, I'm going to talk about a few interesting Maryland connections to that event, and uh, sort of an overview of the construction, and of course, that fateful night, and uh, the context, most importantly, the context. Anyway, enough about that. <laughs> Tonight, we're going to talk about the Revolutionary War in Maryland and the greater context of the war, of course, and how Maryland, what Maryland's role was in it. And uh, this is actually kind of a, it's a three-part lecture, and I, I forgot to uh, include the rest of it. There may not be time for all of it, but there's an interwar period between the uh, Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 that covers the development of the American heavy frigate i.e. USS Constitution and her sisters. We can talk about that, or we can go right to the War of 1812, or depending on how, how quickly this goes, we might be able to cover the whole thing. I promise to keep it to an hour, so uh, that's what we'll do, so let's get started. <laughs> let's see, here we go. Revolution on the Bay, let me get this minimized, and slideshow. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, we're good. All right. So, as you students of history may well know, during this period, George III was king of England from roughly 1760 to 1820. Uh, a few notable events, the Treaty of Paris, 1763, ceded Canada to England, which set the stage for trouble with that. Um, the British Army was garrisoned in, in uh, North America uh, regarding the Indian uprisings, the French and Indian War, so-called. Uh, the first sort of uh, problems arose when they tried to pass the cost of feeding, garrisoning the soldiers to the colonials. They're saying, the British are saying, well, we're here protecting your interests. You, you guys should share the cost. Okay. Colonials didn't see it that way. Um, importantly to remember during this whole period, something that, that quotes Americans and before they were, the term was coined, took for granted in a big way was the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy protected commerce, protected them from um, hegemony from other countries and, and whatnot. Um, and we kind of shined this on during this period and sort of uh, took it for granted. So kick off Stamp Act of 1765, angered all the colonists. It's the first internal tax levied on the colonies, okay, um, on all things paper. Uh, the colonists argued that only colonial assemblies can en enact a tax. So already we have the seeds of self-governance here uh, and, and sovereignty, this, this nascent sovereignty with the uh, people that lived in America. Of course, this re repealed uh, the next year. And then the wonderful Declaratory Act came, came along, courtesy of the Crown, which meant they could pass any laws on the colonies that they wanted. And you got to love their, their uh, sort of top-down, uh, you know, my way or the highway attitude towards the colonies. 
So you basically touched on this just a moment ago, fundamentally different points of view. English society, as you know, is inherently hierarchical and stratified. Colonies were seen as the bottom of the social order. Remember we talked about um, so the colonies being sort of a dumping ground for excess populations in London. Well, that was kind of it. Like if you didn't have any holdings or um, status in England, you ended up in the colonies or you ended up in a prison or you ended up in the Royal Navy. <laughs> it, it, those were your choices. So um, colonials were British subjects. That's what they felt like they were entitled to all liberties and rights of free Englishmen. Yet they, they, they wanted more than that. They wanted they wanted freedom in a, in a word. Um, so then this notion of free Englishmen versus colonial children, this was the schism. The, the crown saw them as these, these unruly colonial children that just wouldn't behave. They didn't know a good thing when they had it. And here they want, they kept wanting more and more and more. So this notion of this notion of nascent Americanism, there was something more than being just loyal British subjects in a British colony, right? There was this idea that we're in this new land and self-governance was on the horizon and sort of on everyone's minds. So what does Britain do? They try to, with you know, cause and effect, they try to um, control just as they did with the Navigation Acts. They try to control the colonies by these series of acts, the Townsend Act of 16, new duties on several imports, including tea. Um, of course, uh, impassioned response led to repeal, except tea, uh, Boston Massacre, Gatsby Affair was, um, yeah, it was basically this uh, ship that people were going to be taken, sent to England and tried in, in British courts in England. And they said, no, no, these people are entitled to, you know, trial by our, our own courts in our own country. Of course, the Boston Tea Party, which you know so well, and the Intolerable Acts, um, which is a blockade of Boston until the, the, the tea from the Tea Party was paid for. So these basically series of sort of inflammatory events, um, these various legislation passed, repealed, passed, repealed. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is actually an artifact on the lower right-hand corner of one of those crates of tea that was dumped into Boston Harbor, okay? All right, I'm trying to move it swiftly along here. So what is Maryland's role in this? Maryland responded in 1774 with relief su uh, supplies to Boston, which is now occupied by the British Army with uh, General Gage in, as military governor of Boston. Um, 17, the same, in May of uh, the same year, residents of Chestertown dumped tea from Brigantine Geddes into Chester River. It was sort of a, a mirroring of what happened in Boston. Um, May 24th, in Virginia Assembly voted the Intolerable Acts as a hostile invasion. Uh, what does Lord Dunmore do? He dissolves the Assembly. So here again, it's like every, rather than a conciliatory approach or a compromise, um, it's very much uh, ruled by the sword. Or if you don't like it, well, guess what? We're going to dissolve your little... Um, little toy government that you set up for yourself over there. Um, Maryland elects delegates to the first Maryland convention also um, at this time and agreed to ban imports from England after December 1st. If tolerable toler acts were not repealed, cease exports after Dece September 10th, uh, 1775. So basically these moves and counter moves to uh, check this, this British uh, hegemony on, well, basically loyal British subjects. So again, well, the unspoken truth here is is this this notion of self-governance and freedom okay so october 14 1775 the brig peggy stewart was beached and burnt by his owner anthony stewart basically he either had to do this or be you know lynched or uh run out on a rail um by uh, uh annapolis citizens they were ecstatic over this when this happened it was the quotes annapolis tea party um, and regarding this, uh, this act was of immense political importance. No other single act in Maryland played a greater role in shaping attitudes individuals adopted towards a political conflict, both within the empire and at home. So um, this is, you know, even, even in wonderful benevolent um, uh, Maryland, there was already sort of a radicalization occurring. So also interestingly, in October, the Privy Council bans arms and gunpowder to the colonies. They knew what was coming, right? Sure. Um, so here we have the Earl of Dunmore. I don't think this is any relation to, to our director, Jeff Murray, but who knows? Jeff may want to chime in on that. Um, he, he had one of the first perceptions of a sea strategy for the Bay, and this is important. Bay was actually a very large body of water, and uh, it was very porous at this time. So he had this sort of idea of uh, ways that the Bay could be uh, controlled, even though they were flawed. Uh, again, couldn't grasp the colonists' desire for self-governance. This was just speaking Chinese to these guys. 
uh, flawed assumption that force was the answer, just wanted to do it, just radicalized people to defend their hearths and homes and made them that much more uh, uh, defiant and um, convinced that their cause was just. Yeah, here's a quote. I shall consider the whole country in rebellion and shall not hesitate to reduce their houses to ashes. Awesome. So this is just <laughs> what I was saying, this ide ideology that made victory by the columns possible, as each man saw it as defense of hearth and home, right? When you're defending, I mean, it's an abstract thing to quote, um, well, this was before we had a country per se, but the idea of defending a country is one thing, but the idea of defending your actual hearth and home and your family, quite another, quite, uh, that hits real close to home. So, um, yeah, so, and again, uh, maximizing on England's real strength, the Royal Navy, this was, this is what they should have done. They did this with the War of 1812, which we'll get to, but in the Revolutionary War, they were, they had, they had boots on the ground, and this was a huge mistake. Oh, yeah, he made, he also made this guy, uh, the ridiculous threat of using Indians and slaves as his army to subdue colonists. I was like, okay, I don't have enough uh, regular British Army soldiers. I'm going to use slaves and Indians. Okay. So Sir Robert Eden was the royal governor of Maryland at this time. He's far more moderate than Dunmore over in Virginia. Uh, he realized he couldn't stop the course of events. It was in the wind. Um, this was the pre prevalent attitude uh, of not only Maryland, but all of the colonies. Uh, so... Second Continental Congress was convened. Yeah, Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen captured Fort Ty uh, Ticonderoga and Crown Point, capturing a, a huge cache of uh, ordnance and ammunition. The siege of Boston, the creation of the Continental uh, Army, and Thomas Johnson, for whom the bridge is named that you, many of you probably cross every day of Calvert County, nominates uh, George Washington as leader of the Army, of the new Continental Army. Um, we have Bunker Hill also at this time was a costly victory, a thousand casualties uh, for the British at Bunker Hill. But what it did was it, it taught the militia, the American, quotes, Continental Army, the, the resolve that England had in terms of sort of seeing these battles through in, in spite of the cost. OK, so um, it was kind of a wake up call for um, the Continental Army. So how do you fund a war? All wars cost money, right? So um, basically the Chesapeake uh, contributed commodities such as tobacco in the lower bay and grain in the upper bay, which helped buy munitions and supplies for the war. Um, moving supplies by sea, of course, is far more efficient and easier at this time than overland, right? By ox cart on bumpy, you know, ill-kept roads, uh, water's the way to go. Small, uh, nimble, shallow draft vessels were built, co-opted, captains knew the bay intimately and used to advantage against the larger British warships. Yeah, I mean, this is a, the same tactics that were employed on the shore, guerrilla tactics, basically against, you know, the, the British regulars were employed on the water. You know, these large, uh, you know, third and fourth rate warships on station in the bay. So what do you do? You smuggle, you, you get very small, swift boats to sort of get around these, these, these giants that uh, take time to get underway and time to maneuver and time to basically fire their cannon. Um, this is a much, much quicker way to do it. Uh, yeah, the base sailors were first-rate smugglers, and uh, they would, uh, yeah, it was all about the duties, right? The cost, the, the, how the Crown was making their money, so they could put supplies, in, uh, goods in at, at different points and dodge those customs duties that the uh, Crown levied on all of that. So Maryland remained relatively quiet through 1776, not, not so in Virginia. Uh, yeah, Dunmore flees to the William as his headquarters because it got so hot for him in Virginia. He realized he needed to get out of town. <laughs> All right, so the Chesapeake Navy as, as such, um, uh, now the Royal Navy was against them, kind of was like, oh yeah, we need something, we need something. So Bay residents realized the need for a Navy now, um, worried about the blockade, of course. And the blockade was, again, pretty porous at this point. It was pretty easy to get in and out of the Bay. Uh, built the defense in 1776, which um, had 18 six pounders and two four pounders, not much of a threat against uh, any of these um, ships of the line that the that, that England had. Uh, six months later, galley construction began, and we're going to hear a lot about these galleys because, again, it's like a guerrilla, it's a guerrilla tactic. These are small shallow draft vessels, cheap to build. Um, in terms of manning them, well, that was that would be problematic for uh, this war and the War of 1812 because you're kind of a sitting duck. I mean, a very lightly armed, but they were fast, okay? Hornet and Wasp were uh, two merchantmen that were converted to warships in Baltimore. And again, exceedingly lightly armed, not much of a threat, but the colonists felt they had to do something to um, kind of develop a naval presence on the bay. End of royal governorship in Maryland. Yeah, um, basically the bottom line, 
uh, Governor Eden leaves on the HMS FOE. Um, Maryland's radicalizing like Virginia, fueled by the media, propaganda. Um, yeah, Eden's mild policies and attitudes kept Maryland relatively calm. I mean, there was, it was not, it wasn't, uh, wasn't unilateral. Certainly, there were flare-ups here and there, but pretty calm up to the Declaration of Independence. And right up until that point, Eden favored reconciliation, um, which, you know, to his credit, I mean, trying to work things out, find a compromise. Um, net effect, um, as we mentioned, uh, with these other efforts of uh, building ships was to speed up naval preparations in Maryland. They knew that blockade was going to be tightening up, and they needed to have some countermeasure to deal with it. So let's talk a little bit about the state of the navies. As you know, France, France would be called in as an ally and, and Spain uh, eventually to the war, but uh, let's talk about the Royal Navy. So uh, basically they had a strong, what's called paper Navy. So the logbooks, ledgers, et cetera, um, all showed that they had this many ships with this many guns, with this many sailors, et cetera. But the actual state of the Navy was it had fallen into disrepair. A lot of the rigging was rotted, um, planking uh, and framing was rotting. Um, these were not uh, frontline weapons. And certainly they didn't want to deploy um, many frontline weapons to the colonies, okay? They, they kept those relatively close to home. Meantime, French had, uh, France had poured resources into its Navy following the Treaty of 1763. They actually had a pretty top line uh, Navy uh, in terms of you know, apples to apples. Um, British began impressment to fill these ships because as you know, this uh, sailor's life was squalor. You get, as, as I mentioned earlier, if you were um, not of means or had no property or, or holdings or status in England, well, you'd find yourself in one of the king's ships um, doing all kinds of awful things and eating all kinds of awful food <laughs> or dying of scurvy. So most of the British fleet was spread out from Quebec to New York. Uh, only two small vessels protected the Chesapeake as late as 1780. So again, the bay was pretty porous in terms of um, getting in and out and keeping the commerce going, okay? So the British plan was to capture New York where they thought loyalist support seemed strong. How did this? Um, it was a defensible harbor, much more so than Boston. It was a central location, so that's important. Uh, so how cap captures New York and outlying forts, large part of Washington's army then winter quarters, okay? Um, this is the famous time when Washington crosses the Delaware, Christmas night of 1776, attacks Trenton and Princeton to, to mo modest victories. So it was modest, modest effect. Um, but it was a, sh a huge shot in the arm for the morale of the, uh, the Continental Army, so-called, okay? So finally, they knew it was coming, um, blockade of the Chesapeake. Um, during the New York campaign, the bay had been open. Maryland, Virginia had increased trade in support of the war. England had to do something about this because the trade was, was basically buying supplies and, and foodstuffs, uh, clothing, et cetera, for the Army. They needed to stop this. So... How orders William Hotham and three ships to the Chesapeake. Hotham arrives on the Capes January 20, 1777 with the Preston, the Brune, uh, took two prizes and basically took up a, a station at the mouth of the Chesapeake. Others arrived, the Phoenix to 44, that's a frigate, and, and another frigate of a smaller number, uh, the Emerald, uh, formed this blockade. But even with this, they could never keep enough ships on station to be uh, totally effective. Um, these smaller shallow draft vessels could slip in and out, especially at night. Um, you know, communications weren't what they are today. So even if they did sight something, getting word to the other ships and getting them sort of mobilized took time. Meantime, this other ship would slip right through and off, off out into the, into the water on, you know, on its way. So... So after the thaw in the winter, uh, Burgoyne and Howe were both lethargic. This, was, this allowed Washington valuable time to rearm with French equipment and weapons. Um, yeah, France enters the war on the side of the colonials February 6th, 1778, and there were treaties of commerce and alliance so that um, France would get a piece of some of the uh, exports uh, that uh, the colonials had, especially, as I mentioned, uh, grain and tobacco, um, and then weapons for the Continental Army. Uh, Howe captures Philadelphia in late September via the Delaware. Uh, he resigns in a fit and was replaced by Clinton, heads for the Chesapeake, reaching the Virginia Capes in mid-August. Um, these galleys that Maryland was building were not ready for how they wouldn't really be effective anyway, although uh, a man named Cook attacked with two. Uh, basically, people, just like the militia, when confronted with uh, superior forces, fled inland. A lot of uh, burning and um, you know, devastation along the coast uh, by British uh, sort of boarding parties that would come ashore. Uh, in longboats and ships boats and just wreak havoc along the coast. Uh, 
Burgoyne surrenders to Gates at Saratoga, October 17th, local rebellion is now World War. So yeah, this is a, a pivotal point uh, in the war. So I mentioned um, privateering or smuggling. This happened to pretty good effect. Um, Colliers Raid uh, destroys Gosport, which is was, was then and continued right up through the Civil War as a major um, port and naval yard, uh, principal shipyard. Um, Bay was relatively unmolested up until this point. Um, yeah, you can see the breakdown, um, escorted merchantmen at sea. Some are, some privateersmen found fortune, most did not. I think um, Commodore Barney, who we'll hear, hear a little bit about in uh, the War of 1812, was very successful at this, okay? So after the after focusing on New York and trying to find loyalist support there, that was sort of problematic, um, was relatively ineffective. So the Brits decided to focus on the South. Um, you know, the Loyalist South. Spain enters the, enters the war importantly in June of 1779. Uh, winter of 1779, 80, the hardest winter memory. Uh, yeah, the bay froze, uh, or nearly froze due to ice. So the commerce uh, was, came to a grinding halt. Uh, Charleston fell May 12th, uh, 6,000 troops. And this was a huge loss. Um, yeah, 6,000 troops and sailors lost, Virginia regiments, South Carolina Navy, key ports, stores, and munitions. This was a huge blow to the continental, uh, continentals, basically. Uh, Cornwallis is in command at this point. Clinton and Arbuthnot head for New York, uh, and there was this faith in militia and gunboats, as I as I talked about, to address um, the regulars on the land and the Royal Navy at sea. Yeah, stalemate in the north. Rochambeau and French army arrive at this time. Admiral Arbuthnot blockades French at Newport, deprives Washington of support, and needed to retake New York. Uh, yeah, Cornwallis overwhelms Gates at Camden, South Carolina. Arnold brings up 16. This is a lot of, you know, moves, counter moves. It's a little hard to follow, but um, fast attacks along the James River. Um, Arbonnet repels the French fleet under destitution, captures the bay. That's the Battle of Cape Henry. So um, this was a decisive battle um, between the French and the, and the Royal Navy. Uh, Cornwallis, meantime, had fortified Yorktown, which is a deep water port. Uh, Washington was finally successful at a joint Franco-Continental force by this time. There had been a lot of uh, logistical problems coordinating the two armies, the French Army and the uh, Continental Army. So Washington finally got it together uh, at this time. De Grasse sails for the Chesapeake from the Caribbean, the West Indies. Uh, news of this reached Washington and Rochambeau in August. De Grasse skirmishes with the Royal Navy under graves off the Virginia Capes. French left in control of the Chesapeake. So what does this mean? A surprise victory. Um, so Cornwallis, since he's at uh, Yorktown, he's deprived of escape by sea. Royal Navy split, right? French are in control now. So he's stuck. Lafayette and the Continentals are blocked land retreat. He's got nowhere to go. So October 191, Cornwallis surrenders. England wanted to press on as England, be, <laughs> England always does, but um, they didn't, they, they realized that it was done. Um, even the colonists didn't immediately realize this meant independence. So um, it was kind of like, it, again, communications being what they were, took them some time to sort of piece together. Okay, yeah, the New York campaign failed and Cornwallis just surrendered. He's the head of their army. The Royal Navy split. So, okay, I guess, I guess we got what we wanted, which was uh, independence. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're going to try to move quickly through this and get right to the War of 1812. I think we can get through all of it. Um, so this is, of course, Treaty of Paris in 1783 formalized the colony's sovereignty. Perceptually, it's quite different. Yeah, on paper, we had our independence, but perceptually, Britain still thought of us as, as she had all along, right? Um, unfortunately, the old Continental Navy, as so-called, was sold in the fall of 1785. As soon as we did that, we worried how we were going to maintain our newly won independence. Again, these problems with the Navy. It's like uh, going to bite the bullet, and this is just what actually happened. So anxiety over lack of an American Navy became acute with Napoleon's rise to power in Europe. It was like, okay, so this is a real threat, and how is it going to affect us? We have no Navy, and this is uh, going to be a problem. Meantime, Barbary powers, which were pirates, seized two American merchant ships in 1785. So this was, quotes, the Algerian problem uh, over in the Mediterranean. Uh, in 1794, Washington made a report to Congress on the Alger Algerian problem. The day demanded $60,000 for 21 Americans. So in 1794, Congress approved a payment of ransom, tribute, and treaty for 90 grand, which would be uh, facilitated by the U.S. Ambassador Colonel Humphreys. So 
it looks like the deal is going to go through, but the day then goes back on that and says, well, if I were to make peace with everybody, what would I do with my Corsairs, my army? They would kill me for want of adventure and more prizes. So that's kind of the system they had over there. This sort of plundering and piracy was how this guy kept his Corsairs in check, kept them happy. Uh, and if he goes and makes peace with this little chunk of money, well, they're not going to be very happy. They'd probably kill him. So this uh, led to the birth of an American heavy frigate or the American 44. Eight, in 1793, eight Algerian vessels had captured 11 American ships, including 106 American sailors. This was still not enough for Congress to create a Navy. The country was outraged, right? Uh, popular support was strong for a Navy. Uh, finally, the Naval Act was approved on March 27, 1794, uh, signed by George Washington. So this uh, bill passed and allowed the president the option of building four 44-gun ships and two 36-guns. Uh, also, funding for officers and listed men were provided with this sort of uh, called an economic incentive package, which is basically just what it was. Uh, and you can see the distribution of this money. So no Navy Department yet. So the whole deal was turned over to Henry Knox, who was the Secretary of War. Uh, Knox accepted Joshua Humphrey's plans for six frigates. Construction contracts were spread out over Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Norfolk, Baltimore, and Portsmouth. So each city got a piece of this. And it was it was jobs, okay? These were um, these vessels took a long time to build. They were involved in many different trades. So it was um, it was an economic stimulus package for all of these cities and gave us a Navy to boot. So Humphrey's design was nothing short of revolutionary. These were fast yet heavy frigates uh, made from Carolina live oak, yellow pine, and red cedar. And here's Humphrey's very uh, sly statement about this. It was determined importance to this country to take the lead in a class of ships not in use in Europe, which would be the only means of making our little Navy of any importance. So what's he talking about? He's talking about, I won't say cheating, but he's <laughs> British, as you know, they're very uh, hierarchical and stratified uh, with their society. Well, same true with the Navy. Navy's divided into very neat categories, right? First rate, second rate, third rate, fourth rate ships, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these ships is supposed to only engage ships of its own class. So 101 guns only engage 101 guns, frigates only exchange or engage frigates and so forth. So what does America do? They come up with a, something that looks like a frigate, but has the proportions and the construction methodology of a much larger ship, right? So they're kind of, kind of cheating, kind of using the British rules against them, okay? So the armament was also gonna pack a punch. Uh, 24 pound long guns, um, these are heavy guns. They went on the gun deck down low, right? Muzzle is almost six inches in diameter, barrel nine foot. Um, so 600 yards uh, range or 1,800 feet. Uh, and Constitution, could, Constitution and her other 44s could carry 30 of these. 32 pound carronade on the spar deck or the weather deck. Uh, these were anti-personnel type weapons that were used for clearing away soldiers and Marines from the opponent's decks. So um, uh, these were placed there. So most British frigates this time only carried uh, 18 pound long or short guns, thus giving frigates like Constitution a marked advantage in firepower, okay? But that's not all she had. Um, the Scantlings, building Constitution, um, Scantlings means proportions or like a two by four. Scantlings is two by four. That's what that means, proportions. The, the Scantlings of these American 44s were equal to the British 74s um, and were built um, with, with very robust timber. This live oak is very dense, tough stuff. I've worked it before I'm building some boats. I mean, it will give you a run for your money with the sharpest chisel. This is um, this is a Constitution class vessel down here, an American 44. This is a British 74 chasing it. You can see it's a much larger vessel. It has two complete gun decks as opposed to a single gun deck and a um, carronade spar deck. But Constitution was built like a 74, okay? Here's some statistics of her uh, proportions, her um, length, uh, Load water line was 175 feet, uh, length overall 204 feet, draft 21, et cetera, et cetera, tonnage, displacement, uh, cost 37,824 pounds sterling to build this, to spill one of these, okay? So in May 1801, when the Pasha Tripoli, uh, Basha Karamanli, sent his henchmen to chop down the flagpole at the American consulate in Tripoli, U.S. construed this is an act of war. Okay, America was itching for a fight anyway, right? She has this big, powerful Navy looking for any excuse to test it out, right? This is where, incidentally, uh, the Marine Corps uh, cut their teeth. Uh, also Montezuma and the shores of Tripoli, right? So Constitution and Philadelphia were ordered to the Barbary Coast along with several small bridges and schooners. Uh, Preval aboard Constitution was in command. 
Uh, Bainbridge runs the Philadelphia ground. It's kind of embarrassing. There it is in the um, upper uh, bubble here. There's the Philadelphia heeled over. The guy, America didn't really, they had these beautiful new frigates. They really didn't know how to sail them well yet. So all they had is this voyage across the ocean uh, to the Mediterranean. They really didn't, weren't comfortable working this vessel as a, as a team. So, okay, we're doing good on time. So Prevost Squadron assaults the Pirate Stronghold typically on August 3rd and 7th, 1880, uh, 1804. And it's been said that the war with Tripoli served to train the American Navy that fought in the War of 1812. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't much opportunity at this point to train, so this will do. Um, Treaty with the day was signed in Constitution's cabin in June 1805. Uh, $60,000 was paid for release of American captives, after which no further payments would be made by America. Why didn't America have to do that because she had these two big heavy frigates sitting right off the coast with those beautiful long guns ready to pound Tripoli to dust if the day didn't comply. So blue water diplomacy in a nutshell, right? That's why, you know, we saw England did this so effectively. That's why we needed it too. So 1805, Nelson, Admiral uh, Ratio Nelson, uh, Lord Nelson, observed Constitution from Gibraltar and said, in handling of those transatlantic ships, there's a great nucleus of trouble for the Navy of Great Britain. He saw one of these, he saw either Philadelphia or Constitution or it was Constitution in this case, uh, and saw that this was a, a very different type of vessel and that it was gonna be trouble for England and it's true. Uh, so Constitution heads home for a refit. Uh, meantime, one of the greatest naval engagements of all time was brewing off the Spanish coast, which as you know, Trafalgar at this time, British fleet, uh, under Nelson engaged combined French and Spanish fleets of 30, uh, 33 ships under Villeneuve. The French and Spanish lost 22 ships. Britain lost none, but they did lose Nelson, right? He fell on the, on the quarter deck and uh, was sent home in a barrel of rum. Uh, they pickled him so they get him home. And um, I tell you, England takes their Nelson very seriously. <laughs> they really do. Um, so this was a, a decisive battle in the Napoleonic Wars. It also established Britain's global naval supremacy. Their maritime ascendancy came to the fore and was solidified at Trafalgar. Okay. So back in America at this time, 1801, 1809, President Jefferson, he didn't really believe or want a blue water navy that America had just gone to all this trouble to build um, because they were costly to maintain, costly to refit. Um, problematic to uh, crew and victual and uh, keep, keep uh, munitions on board and keep uh, large stores of, of shot and all of that. These large vessels required a huge infrastructure to supply them and keep them in combat ready. So Jefferson thought, well, you know, here's the birth of American isolationism. We have this one of these two huge oceans. Why don't we just have gunboats as a coastal defense? Uh, and that'll be it. They're much cheaper to build. Um, take a lot less men, a lot less cannon, a lot less food, blah, blah, blah. So this was his idea. It was a bad idea. Um, 1807, England outlaws slavery in Britain, just as an incidental um, uh, move. So there we are. We're doing what we're doing well. We can still bust through the War of 1812. That sort of sets the stage um, for the War of 1812. America has her Blue Water Navy, so-called, with um, the American Heavy 44s and 236s. Uh, and this collection of uh, gunboats and small coastal defense. So that was kind of the, the stage uh, on which we set the, uh, for the War of 1812. So the cause of the war, a lot of people call this the phony war. Um, impressment was cited as one of the big ones. Uh, the British Navy was still impressing Americans into service on His, Her Ma His Majesty's ship. So this was, uh, of course, an important, uh, very, you know, intolerable thing for Americans because Americans are Americans now, right? They had sovereignty to their own country, their own Navy. And what right did Britain have to take Americans and push them into service on His Majesty's ship? So this was pretty much the um, single overarching reason that was cited for this. Of course, the British blockade of the continent in France um, due to the Napoleonic War was seen as a violation of freedom of the seas. Bottom line, bottom line, um, Madison really wanted the war. He really did. Um, it's a classic case of hawks versus doves. We see it all the time in American history and <laughs> not just American history. Um, some want war. They see it as a viable um, solution to conflict um, rather than diplomacy. So Madison really was itching for a war. Um, it's important also to note that uh, Britain saw this war, this so-called war, 
as just a minor theater in the broader context of the Napole Napoleonic Wars, right? Napoleonic Wars was the main event for Britain. This was just sort of another nuisance. Oh, these colonials, they're at it again. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of smaller reasons, Canadian aspirations. Uh, uh, England promised Canada some of their um, that they could get some of the land back that, that was currently American, et cetera, et cetera. So there were there were certain um, moves: British arming of the native peoples and attacking frontier towns. This was another largely propaganda uh, type of thing uh, to, to foment the war. Okay. Maryland stands during all of this. Can you guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty mo well, pretty moderate as it always is. You got to love Maryland for that. Um, sizable anti-war sentiment. Uh, New England was uh, most against the war, especially Boston. The uh, governor of Boston sent uh, Madison a note saying, "You've not made a case for exigency for this war. I don't see the need to go. We don't see the need in Boston for us to uh, to do this. We think it's a ridiculous idea." Um, 1812, June 18, 1812, Madison asked Congress for a declaration of war. It gets it. Um, yeah, Baltimore riding condone against British and Federalists. So um, already we're, we're sort of starting the ball rolling. So the U.S. Navy on the eve of war, um, Constitution, President of the United States, 44 guns, Congress 36, Essex 32. We had sloops, ship rigged sloops, John Adams of 20 guns, Hornet and Wasp of 18 each you'll remember them from uh, earlier from the war of the revolutionary war seven brigs argus siren nautilus fix and enterprise anita and viper so that's kind of our navy on the eve of the war of 1812. the gunboats as i mentioned uh, jefferson was totally enamored of them uh after people's success using them against the barbary pirates yeah i mean this is kind of the what the what the british did during the revolutionary war sort of these these vessels went on raiding parties with marines or soldiers and uh, we're able to wreak havoc and get in and get out quickly. Uh, so Jefferson saw this as a viable coastal defense. And we'll go figure. Jefferson and others felt they were cost-effective means of a national defense and naval militia of sorts. Meantime, you know, wasn't taking the, into consideration sort of the global context of the, of the various other navies, the French, the Spanish, and the English. So at the outbreak of uh, outbreak, the Navy had about 170 gunboats, but less than 20 of them were combat ready. So here, America has a paper Navy of uh, 170 gunboats that. Uh, seem like they're ready for combat, but less than 20 are actually ready to go, okay? So in terms of the uh, distribution of troops or air infantry on the bay, you had Fort McHenry at Baltimore, sort of the northern anchor. You had Fort Norfolk at its namesake city in, in Virginia in the south. Uh, both forts were manned by a small amount of, uh, you know, American regulars, mixture of Army, Marines, Garrison, and D.C. Everything else was up to the militia. So we had, again, a small standing army, and basically a um, nascent militia that uh, could be called up um, to supplement this. Uh, situation in Maryland was representative of the rest of the country, so it's true for the part, it's true for the whole. And here you can see um, the, the two forts. Uh, there's Fort Norfolk here and then Fort McHenry up here. All right. So as, as I mentioned a few seconds ago, the British position was the War of 1812 was just a minor facet of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, North Atlantic Squadron Patrol from Nova Scotia to the Caribbean, six ships of the line, 31 frigates, 33 smaller vessels. So they learned their lesson with the Revolutionary War. Britain wasn't, <laughs> you've seen uh, Apocalypse Now, right? Don't get out of the boat. Well, <laughs> that was England's, that was England's attitude towards the War of 1812. We're not going to get sucked into this protracted land campaign and this, you know, uh, this, this extensive guerrilla warfare where we just get slaughtered. So we're going to stay on our ships. We're going to restrict this to basically a naval effort for this, quote, War of 1812. Um, so they blockaded New York, Philadelphia, Delaware River, and the Chesapeake. Uh, it took till February 1813 to assemble and take up stations, including Norfolk. Again, these, these larger warships, communications being imperfect at best, getting the, getting the word out and getting people on station took time. And you can basically see the, um, this map on the right. Here's the Chesapeake right here in the middle. And of course, this um, Jackson's New Orleans campaign we'll get to in a bit at the very end. Even though the war was over, he went and the treaty had been signed. He went on and did this anyway, because again, uh, communications were poor, right? So privateers, uh, two weeks after the war was declared by Congress, approved an act in considering letters of mark, prizes, and prize goods. Sure, it worked during the Revolutionary War. Why shouldn't it work during this? You know, these large, cumbersome British warships. Um, let's uh, let's do the 
uh, state-sanctioned piracy, which is what letter of mark uh, types of uh, situations are. So the result were brigs, sloops, and schooners fanned out from the Chesapeake searching for prey. Sure, it's like, um, yeah, exactly, it works, it works, it works well. So um, Joshua Barney and the, Ross, and the Rossi captures 18 vessels worth 1.5 million taking 217 prisoners. Yeah, he, he did well, um, Revolutionary War and this war with that. He was a really good privateer. So of course I have to mention this, um, America had been itching for a fight with the British Navy, the Royal Navy, uh, to test out these new frigates in a, in a major way, even though, as I mentioned, it's sort of an unfair advantage. So USS Constitution, commanded by Captain Isaac Hull, sails from the Chesapeake Bay on July 12th. The 17th British, British Squadron gave chase. Constitution evaded pursuers after, yeah, two days and put it in Boston to replenish water. Now, um, yeah, Hall wrote, disobeys orders. He was ordered to stay put, but he said, nope, I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving from Boston August 2nd. I didn't get the word or it fell in the, fell in the water. I, I didn't see it, <laughs> you know. Um, better, to, uh, better to apologize and ask, for, ask permission. So uh, on the 19th, he finds Guerriere 600 miles to the east. Um, Gary had been a captured British um, frigate from the French in 1806 and was under command of Captain James Duff. So they gave chase. You can see um, this is Constitution in the middle in this lower uh, painting with her stunsel set. Um, she's basically trying to, very light winds. The, the boats are pulling her along under light breezes, trying to uh, evade the uh, British fleet here. So that was a sort of a misleading. Um, image because the action I just described was between Gary and Constitution. There was no other vessels in sight. Um, this is a quote, the stranger was hauled as wind laid for us. It was evident that he was an English man of war, a large class and all ready for action. As we came up, she began to fire. And this is Constitution down here in the lower right with Gary Air uh, off here. You can tell them apart in a second. Constitution has a white gun bound, gun band along the, gun, the lower gun deck. The British ships all have a yellow ochre a gun ban. That's how you can tell the British frigates from the American frigates. So Constitution's gunners aimed for Guerrier's hull. Within 15 minutes, her mizzenmast fell. Guerrier's jib boom became entangled in Constitution's rigging. When she pulled away, it took down her main and foremasts. So this is where she named, uh, earned her name, Old Ironsides. I should mention uh, that name was basically because the framing and planking uh, of Old Ironsides, the frames, which are the ribs of the ship, were spaced on Constitution about an inch apart. On the British uh, frigates, they're spaced about six inches apart, right? So you basically, on Constitution, have a wall of solid white oak or live oak and white oak of about two feet at its widest point. British ships, you didn't have that. You had space between the planking and framing, which could basically allow a cannonball to punch through and hull or pierce the hull of the British warships. So once this masted, this vessel has no maneuvering power and um, it, the battle's over, okay? Um, so yeah, this is the famous quote, huzzah, her, her, her sides are made of iron as the British warship fired upon her and the cannonball simply bounced off, right? They left little, little tiny divots in the hull planking, but that's it, they did not puncture her at all. So not really a fair fight, <laughs> but we'll take it. <laughs> So um, Hull was replaced by uh, Commodore Bainbridge on October 27th. Uh, Constitution left Boston for the West Indies, countered the British frigate Java off the coast of Brazil, morning of December 29th. So same deal. Within an hour of the engagement, all of Java's spars have been shot away. Conclusion of the battle, Java was scuttled, uh, which means blown up. So you can see up in the upper left, the exchange of broadsides. Uh, here, her foremast is gone. And af after that, the rest of them fell. A charge, the men were evacuated to Constitution and the ship was blown up or scuttled. So, yeah. So, um, that was a huge shot in the arm for the, the American public. This, we finally had beat the British at their own game. British had this uh, reputation for being the greatest maritime power in the world. And here we had just sunk two of her frigates with uh, Constitution. So that was a huge shot in the arm and a validating experience for the American Navy, so-called. Um, I can't stress how important that was at the time. So meantime, this character, this lovable guy, Rear Admiral George Cockburn, was assigned to the North American Station, November of 1812. 
He harassed shipping, burned homes, upset commerce up and down the Chesapeake. Um, his base of operations was Tangier Island. You can see in this map down here, basically his uh, sort of attack plan. There's Tangier Island down in the lower right, and this is his striking distance. He was quite uh, up, up and down the bay, wreaking all kinds of havoc. His raid on Havre de Grasse on May 3rd, 1813 was, um, was awful. He, he was particularly vicious, and this event cemented a hatred for Cockburn. Uh, he continued his reign of terror through, throughout 1813. And here's this wonderful portrait of him standing very imperiously on the ground with homes and flames behind him. Yeah, everybody loved this guy, not so much. Okay, so Barney's flotilla. So as I mentioned, these, um, we had these, uh, we had some gunboats, less than 20. Uh, we needed something to match the British barges and cutters that were used in raiding parties, um, something more than that, so more than we had. So Joshua, Joshua Barney submitted his plan in July of 1813 to use a flying squadron of sail and row galleys, okay? Shallow draft, they would row sailed, as we mentioned, carried one long gun, usually one carronade. So one, one gun to, to basically do some damage to their ship and one carronade is an anti-personnel device. Um, there are two sizes, 70 foot and 50 foot. The uh, former were more successful. But finding men to man the galleys was problematic, just like the um, militia. It was tough to find people to row and man these boats because they were, they were lightly armed, but they were fast. So it was kind of a tough argument to get people to uh, man these vessels. So we have, uh, Colton, this culminates, he, he did though, and we have culminates with the first battle of St. Leonard Creek, which is right here in our backyard. June 8th through 10th, 1814, Barney was three miles up the Patuxent. Captain Robert Barry tried to lure him out by attacking farmers and locals. It failed. Um, the St. Lawrence Jester uh, and Dragon arrived, reinforcing the blockade at the mouth of the Patuxent. Barney retreats up St. Leonard Creek, then blocked in by the British. Barney was, importantly, Barney was reinforced by troops and artillery on the banks of the creek, which looked down on the, um, on the creek and the British warships. It was a good tactical spot, the high ground. Skirmishing ensued, St. Lawrence ran aground, then battered by Barney's barges. So um, British burn towns, and, the British are mad, so what do they do? They, they burn towns and properties up and down the river. They're not, they're not getting the naval victory that they hope for. So what do they do? They, they, they burn and, and destroy uh, property along the coast, sort of a passive aggressive move. So second battle, Leonard Creek, the first battle was, um, I won't say it's a draw, but it was, it was inconclusive. Um, gun emplacements were fortified at Peterson Point. Narcissus joined Loire at the mouth of the creek, along with several barges and rocket barges, plus 100 Royal Marines. Battle began at 4, 10 a.m. in the morning, very early. Uh, Loire sustained more damage from artillery and Barney's barges. Narcissus also sustained damage uh, below the waterline. She began to, to, to sink. Um, the Brits were through allowing Barney to escape up, not up to, uh, to Nottingham upriver. So he was able to slip out of the creek and get away while sustaining a pretty good victory. You can see this um, map here of uh, Peterson Point and the British frigates at the mouth of St. Leonard Creek. Um, and here's Barney's barges up to the creek where they, they sort of came down, you know, took pot shots and then withdrew. Um, and that sort of uh, hit and run tactic worked really well. This is a drawing that's, that was done by our former um, muralist, uh, Tim Shire, at the Museum of the Se Second Battle of St. Leonard Creek. This is on display in one of our cases in the, in the War of 1812 case in the Maritime Gallery. And it's just a wonderful illustration showing um, Loire and Narcissus on station here the, on the left and right. And the British um, barges, which are in the foreground, you can see the Union Jack naval ensign right here on the flagstaff. And off in the distance with the American flag are Barney's barges. And this is Leonard Creek off to the left. And this high ground is where various artillery positions were um, situated. You can see in the lower left, um, that's a carronade on the, on the for forward part of the gunboat, um, ready to uh, wreak havoc on, the, on Barney's barges. And actually, a lot of research was done into these, the shape of these barges. Um, and uh, I think some new research was, was uncovered um, courtesy of Don Schumet and Ralph Eshelman. And uh, I think Tim Shire even had an active hand in exploring this to come up with this configuration of these uh, vessels. This is our maritime case at the museum. I would encourage you to come visit if you haven't already showing the mural in the background that I just showed you, as well as a selection of artifacts. Um, there's a swivel gun on the right. Uh, it's a draw knife, uh, various other tools, a pierced tin lantern, some crockery. This is a stove 
a cooking stove with basically a block of limestone. It was placed uh, on the deck to cook on. And um, this is a galley that was not quite accurate. This was done from a Chappelle drawing. But we had this nice model. One of these days, we should get a better model made to reflect the research that um, Ralph Eshelman, Tim Shire, and Don Chimette did uh, for the galleys. We have um, some of the weapons up above, boarding pikes and a rocket and a blunderbuss. Okay. So, so Bladensburg, um, the conclusion of the Napoleonic War occurred in April of 1814, which importantly freed up ships and men to fight the war with, with the US, with us. Um, so this was bad news for us. Um, but again, Britain saw this as uh, just an annoyance, a thorn in their side. It wasn't a major campaign. Uh, August 20, uh, 24th, Ross Thornton British Army reached Bladensburg from Benedict. So after the Patuxent um, uh, camp, the uh, St. Leonard's Creek campaign, they kind of went north, uh, put in at Benedict and reached Bladensburg. They met by General Winder, who was leading U.S. forces, assisted by Smith and our good old friend Barney. Um, British casualties higher than the Marylanders, but uh, had routed U.S. forces, unfortunately. So U.S. retreat was hasty and disorganized, as was characteristic of sort of a militia effort. Most fled back to their homes, thinking they were going to be burned again, right? So um, British certainly have earned a reputation for doing that. Of course, the, um, from Bladensburg, Ross marched on Washington. Uh, Madison's, he had to flee, uh, flee the White House without dinner. The table was set for dinner and they left. When the British uh, got there, there was a, a whole dining room table set for dinner with food on the plates. <laughs> they burned the Capitol, the White House, uh, the State and War Departments, and some other federal buildings. The Washington Navy Yard was uh, torched by us to prevent it falling into enemy hands because it had significant quantities of ordnance, um, gunpowder, um, various other munitions and weapons that didn't want to fall into enemy hands. So as if by providence, a huge thunderstorm extinguishes the fire in Washington, okay? But uh, that sent a real, that was a, that was a real, that was a real um, devastating uh, thing, a real, it was like right at our heart, my nation's capital, the British burned it. So um, anywho. So let's talk about Baltimore now, the last major campaign. Smith had 15,000 men guarding the city. There's a massive wooden chain uh, link boom across the Patapsco River. It's meant to deprive the uh, British from getting up that river. Um, Fort McHenry was fortified to 1,000 men, com commanded by uh, Major George Armistead. There were 600 floating troops that could attack any British landing. Uh, so Cochrane comes up September 11th, uh, 1814. Seems seemingly a a key, key date in American history at this point, um, appeared September 11th in 1814, expecting basically just disorganized militia, same as always, right? But this was not the case. Um, Baltimore had been very methodically and systematically fortified, and uh, we, we, they were ready. They were ready. The 80-gun tonnet on board was uh, Francis Scott Key, who was able to witness this attack on Fort McHenry. And yeah, as I mentioned, British were only expecting militia. This is Fort McHenry up in the upper hand right uh, here. You can see the earthworks and the ramparts. So the results of this battle, uh, General Ross was killed and the British were repelled. Uh, it was an epic exchange of cannon and rocket fire, uh, of course, chronicled in uh, Key's Star Spangled Banner, rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air. This happened all night. Uh, bulk of the British fleet left for Halifax and Bermuda and other points. They said, okay, we're done. <laughs> um, I'm tired of these colonials. Um, skirmishing continued from Tangier Island, nominal blockade, signing of a treaty was December of 1814. So Britain basically stuck a fork in and said, we're done here. Fine. Um, <laughs> you guys can have your independence. We'll, we'll give. And actually, what's interesting is um, since this point, uh, since the War of 1812, United States and the United Kingdom have been fast friends, all you know, with with, with a few exceptions, uh, ever since. So it's kind of I see these two wars as companion pieces, um, just like the the end of the First World War required the Second World War to solve all the problems. Well, War of 1812 was required uh, to solve the lingering problems that were left at the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. So yeah, Cochran, our, our good old friend Cochran, who just loves to burn things. And Peckenham attacks New Orleans and was repulsed by Andrew Jackson January 1815. So, as I said, word traveled slowly, even though the treaty was signed in December, um, right? He attacks in January, uh, not that long, a month later. Treaty of Ghent was ratified February 17th, 1815.
So I think that actually is it. So we made it with five minutes to spare. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any questions or comments? It's kind of a lot. I'm sorry I kind of had to ram ramrod through it. Anybody? No? Nothing? Okay. I'd just like to say thank you. Very, very enlightening. There were a number of things in there that I had not heard of before. Thank you very much. Oh, oh yeah, like like what? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I Some don't of know. the nuances and things in the battle. Okay. 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 Yeah, I mean Maryland, Maryland had a I mean what's interesting, Maryland had a pretty the Chesapeake Bay had a pretty strong role, pretty strong role, almost a principal role in both of these battles, Revolutionary War and War of 1812. So I mean we had the, the deep sea battles. Constitution Guerriere, those types of things were spectacular in their own right, but really a lot of the, the blockade was in this region. It's pretty in Washington to the uh, to the northwest uh, and Baltimore, so uh, major shipyard of the south. So um, anyway, yeah. Any others? No? Okay. Well, well thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Um very much appreciate the lecture this evening. Very informative. Uh, I want to thank all of you for participating and remind you that the next lecture in this series uh, is uh, Thursday, what is that, April 22nd in 14 days at 5 p.m. Uh, and that we will have a special lecture, as Mark mentioned, next Wednesday evening at 5 p.m. on the Titanic, and we will be exploring some Maryland connections. Uh, of course, is the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, and uh, I look forward to that one as well. Thank you all for participating, and with that, we'll sign off. Unless